the best cue I know for getting people quiet in this room is to say Shabbat Shalom, but... Okay. No photographs. Okay. And cell phones off. Anything else coming? Okay. Rabbi Shimon Omer, Al Shlosha Devarim Haolam Omeid, Al Hadin Al Hamet, Vial Hashalom, Klomar Emet Umishpat Shalom, Shivtu Besharechem. Rabbi Simon taught that the world stands on three things justice, truth, and peace, as it says, execute the judgment of truth, justice, and peace in your gates, quoting Zechariah. Although Rabbi Shimon reverses the order of justice and truth, I believe that the prophet Zechariah had it correct. Truth has to go first. Justice is dependent on truth, and without justice, there can be no peace in the world. Very soon after this past fall's election, as Rabbi Shimon and Zechariah's words reverberated within me on an almost daily basis, I knew that as a synagogue we were morally bound to reverently embrace and embody the words of our forebears. And as Reformed Jews, we are doubly bound, for our Judaism is a Judaism of the Enlightenment and glorifies the Enlightenment's own passion and search for truth. This morning's discussion, therefore, is a must for the American synagogue today. And I wanted Temple Micah to foster this conversation. And I knew that it would be very easy to find the journalists to make it happen. I needed just to stand in the lobby for a couple of weeks and invite these fine people as they walk through the door. So thank you, Jody, Naftali, Dana, and Elizabeth for being here this morning. Thank you for what you do, and thank you also for being part of Temple Micah. And I really, really... I, I, I truly mean that for all of you, so just thank you. I'll introduce Jody, who will, who will in turn introduce the rest of the panel. Jody is the assistant managing editor for CNN Politics and was the editor of CNN's book on the 2016 presidential race unprecedented, the election that changed everything. Although we know Jody is past president of the congregation and as a dear friend, outside of these walls, Jody is a nationally known award-winning journalist specializing in politics and policy who has covered the White House, Congress, and presidential campaigns. She's former president of Journalism and Women's Symposium and a graduate of the University of Illinois and a Washington Nationals fan. Finally, I would like to note that this morning's event marks the very first project that is being funded by our Temple Micah Innovation Fund. Thank you to all those of you who have contributed to that fund. The entire session is being professionally video recorded, as you can see. It will then be transcribed and then edited to a 20-minute film version of highlights. All three, the full version, the transcribed that you'll be able to read, and the, and the film version in 20 minutes will all be available on our website. This is an effort to respond to the request to make what we do here at MICA available to the wider world. And finally, thank you all of you for being here as well. Thank you, Rabbi Zemel. You know, I, I didn't realize until you started talking that we were supposed to do this in Hebrew, and I, I might have forgotten to tell the panelists that, so. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping first. You are all being given or have been given little cards to write down questions that we'll get to toward the end of this discussion. If you, once you've written down your question, please pass them to the outside aisles. People will collect them in about a half hour. And um, Rabbi Zemmel will be our editor and decide which questions I should ask in what order. So you have to make them really good. Uh, I want to introduce our esteemed panelists. And you are in luck, because we really got the creme de la creme here today. Um, first, uh, on the far end, we have Dana Milbank. Dana is a nationally syndicated op-ed columnist with The Washington Post. I'm sure most of you have read and uh, chuckled along or been horrified by his columns. <laughs> his column generally appears four times a week in the Post and in 275 other newspapers. 
Dana provides political commentary on TV and radio outlets, and he's the author of three books on politics. Before joining The Post, Dana was a senior editor at The New Republic, where he covered the Clinton White House with me, uh, and um, was a reporter for The Wall Street Journal, where he covered Congress and was a London-based correspondent. And he's about to get married. <laughs> yes, the officiant is right here. If only the bride were here, we could do it right now. <laughs> get it over with. <laughs> um, Elizabeth Miller is the Washington bureau chief of the New York Times. As a Times correspondent, she's covered the Pentagon, John McCain's 2008 presidential campaign, and the White House, a beat she began on, get this, September 10th, 2001. During her five years covering the Bush administration, Elizabeth also wrote a weekly column called White House Letter about people and behind the scenes events of the presidency. Earlier in her career, Elizabeth worked for the Washington Post in Washington, New Delhi, Tokyo, and New York. And she also is the author of three books. And then next to me is Naftali Ben David. He's an editor in the Wall Street Journal's Washington Bureau and formerly spent many years at the Chicago Tribune. He also has covered the White House, Congress, and the courts, and did a stint in Brussels covering the European Union. Naftali was a longtime regular guest on the Diane Rehm Show and now appears regularly on 1A with Joshua Johnson. So welcome to all of you and thank you so much for being here. So I'd like to start by talking about this whole question of post-truth. When Rabbi Zemel said to me, Let's, we want to do a panel on post, the post-truth era, I thought, wait a minute, we're still trying to tell the truth. What's this all about? So I did some reporting on it and found out that uh, the Oxford Dictionary uh, declared that post-truth was the word of the year in 2016. They said that use of the word post-truth increased by approximately 2,000% over its us usage in 2015 and attributed that to Brexit and the US presidential race. Here is how the Oxford English Dictionary defines post-truth. They say it's an adjective relating to or denoting circumstances in which objective facts are less influential in shaping public opinion than appeals to emotion and personal belief. Interestingly, they, they don't define it as after the truth. They, they talk about it as belonging to a time in which this concept is unimportant or irrelevant. So I'd like to start by asking the panelists if you agree that we're in a post-truth era, and if so, in what way? So why don't I start with you, Naftali? I mean, to me, that would be a little bit too sweeping to talk about this being a post-truth era. One thing that occurs to me is, if I'm not mistaken, I think the circulation of all of our publications jumped right after Donald Trump was elected. And to me, that says that there's still a great number of people, I would, without proof, I uh, think it's a majority of the people who are still very interested in verifiable, confirmed facts and the kind of work we do where nothing we report hasn't been carefully ascertained and vetted and, and edited and, and, and scrutinized. Um, so uh, to me, that sounds too sort of grand to talk about this being a post-truth era. I mean, that said, I do find it a little bit disturbing or disconcerting that there does seem to be a certain segment of the population and a certain number of the leaders of uh, various factions uh, that are, I think, all too willing to discount facts that either come from sources that they don't like or that make them uncomfortable and don't fit into their worldview and the way they like to see things. Uh, so I do find that it, I guess, disconcerting phenomenon, uh, even while I guess I still have faith that there's large numbers and majorities of people who still really want to find out the reality as it is. And uh, you raise an interesting point that people now often look to publications websites, television stations with which they agree. And they often now are in more of a bubble than in the old days when there were three networks and everybody read the newspaper. 
So Elizabeth, do you find that that changes the way we in the main, what we call the mainstream media, do our jobs and does it, does it do damage to what we're trying to do? Sure, I mean, I, first of all, I'd like to say that I think any political campaign uh, is part of, the, a part of a post-truth era because a lot of, most political campaigns appeal to emotions and, and passions. So we saw it on steroids in this last election, obviously. But it certainly it's changed the way we do things at the New York Times. We have just employed a full-time fact check writer. I mean, you've had one for a long time. But we have a, we have a stable now, but we have per, a person in the Washington Bureau. She came from PolitiFact. And she writes three, four times a week. I mean, just, and we're trying to now actually, because we focus so much on Donald Trump and the Republicans, we're trying to try and focus a little bit on the Democrats, but the Republicans are, are keeping us very busy. So we've changed the way we do things. Um, we have also changed, um, I could just briefly, uh, we have done it twice now in headlines and in, in, in lead stories in the Times written that the president lied, which is a new, uh, new road for us. Um, uh, it was a decision made way above my pay grade. Um, but, uh, oh, I see, we're not being amplified. Oh, we're not amplified? We're just being recorded. Oh. Can you hear me now? Do I have to just speak in here? <laughs> okay, I have to talk louder. Can you hear me now? I'm going to have to shout, OK. So um, th there's nothing to be done about the microphone? You're working on it, OK. I will talk very loudly. So uh, this is the first time, as I said, that we've written in headlines and in the lead stories in the Times, the president lied. And that has, can you hear me now? Is that better? OK. And that has changed, uh, uh, that's a big change. Um, in the past, if we would say the president uh, uh, you know, uh, uttered a falsehood or it was inaccurate, but it was a decision made by the executive editor, Dean Baquet, in New York that there were two, two cases. The first was when the president continued to say that Obama was born, was not born in the United States. And so the decision was made that this was so, um, he had done it so often, uh, it was so sustained over such a long period of time, and it was uh, against all evidence that it was time to call it a lie. The same, we did the same thing more recently when the president said that three million people had voted illegally in 2016 in the election. And again, that was a decision made in New York. It was a sustained uh, assertion over a long period of time, and we just called it like that. So that's very different. I could go on, but let me. And I want to, yes, yeah. and I'm going to want to come back to that. Uh, and, but Dana, you are the only person here who actually is paid to have an opinion. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the, the rest of us do it for free. Yes, that's right. Yeah. So, so tell us a little bit about how you deal with um, what a, lo a lot of us can only sometimes call a lie. Um, we, we've used all kinds of euphemisms, falsehoods, evidence-free, uh, baseless, and these kinds of descriptions. But you, you, you cut right to the chase. How has your life changed? Well, I'm here because they needed somebody on this panel to defend Donald Trump. <laughs> so, and that's what I'm going to do and say, I disagree with the New York Times decision to say he's lying. I don't think he is. Um, and let me explain why. Um, I, did a, I did a piece on this uh, um, but very early in the administration. Uh, I think it was a, that Saturday or Sunday after the inauguration. He was talking to the... Uh, CIA, and he said, you know, he's given this inaugural speech, and there were some drops of rain. He's like, oh no, this is going to be bad. And he said, and then the rain stopped, and there was bright sunshine. So I was there, like 20 feet from him, and it was raining on me. <laughs> so um, so I, I got in touch with the, the Capitol Weather Gang at the Washington Post for some satellite imagery. Um, and the, the, you know, the rain maps and the weather maps to see that, no, there was un, unbroken cloud cover you know, from here to West Virginia during, during that, that period of time. Um, and then there was also a 360-degree uh, you know, camera, so you could actually look at the sky through the entire speech, which I did also. Um, <laughs> uh, but I think what this shows is that it's not to lie, it means, first of all, it has to be untrue. And second of all, uh, you have to know it's untrue. And I'm concerned that uh, the president doesn't think he's lying because he believes what he's saying when he's saying it. 
Uh, and his biographer who did the, uh, or the, the guy who did the art of the deal with him said that, you know, more than any human being he's ever met, uh, Donald Trump has the ability to believe that whatever the last thing to come out of his mouth is true, or at least ought to be true. Um, so I think that's the difficulty in saying it's a lie, because I, I think it's worse than that, and that is I think um, uh, that he doesn't actually uh, think he's lying. So you would never say that he lies? Um, well, you, you have to, I, well, I'm sure if I said that now, you'd go back and find some instance where and, I said. And then you'd have to eat another column. I, right, so I'm not gonna, I'm not, I'm not gonna be absolute and uh, take, take any such risk, but, uh, um, but it is possible that there's something else going on here, and that's a different kind of madness than somebody who knows he's saying something not But true. this shows how circumstances have changed for us in ways that we never envisioned. I mean, we always have to make these calls, I think all of us do, when the president says something, or people close to him, or other well-placed individuals that seems untrue or wildly implausible or has no evidence to back it up. We have to figure out how to frame it, because we do try to be careful. And so I happened to be working on Saturday when there was the tweet about President Obama having wiretapped him and he being a sick and bad person. And it seemed wildly implausible. It didn't seem like it could be true. The president can't individually order wiretaps of people. So it had to have been some kind of incredible conspiracy for this to be correct. But there we were. It's hard to prove a negative you know, in the 10 minutes you have before the story has to go online. So you're trying to craft things like you know, unsubstantiated and without evidence and explaining how the system really works. And do you say widely discredited or do you say false? And at what point is it okay to sort of change the adjective? So, um, I mean, we have endless deliberations within the newsroom uh, in an attempt to get it exactly right and to sort of frame what's been said with what, you know, against what we know to be true. And particularly if the assertion has been repeated in the face of contrary evidence, you know, how do you frame that? And it's just not something we've ever really had to deal with in journalism before. And you at the Journal also have a standard having to do with intent, do you not? Well, th so this is the lie thing has come up. And I, I don't, I, in a way, I don't, like, I don't think we should put too much emphasis on this debate about whether or not you use lie or you don't. We're all trying to make the best calls we can. I think you know, um, our editor sort of felt like that was a level of intentionality that we didn't want to get into, that if we say that something is false and it's been repeated you know, in the face of contrary evidence, our readers can figure out whether they're smart enough to figure out whether they think you know, it was a lie or it wasn't a lie. But, but I think the broader point is just that we're all trying to wrestle with how to frame uh, you know, you know, these, the situation where people in the White House in senior positions are saying things that just seem to be contrary to the evidence. And, but you know, if we're talking about a post-truth era, you know, it isn't just the White House. I mean, there's this whole conspiracy group out there that thinks that Sandy Hook, this massacre of these children at elementary school, was a hoax. You know, there's the Comet Pizza thing. I mean, I think, I think this is sort of a broader issue than just what's going on at the White House. Elizabeth, you famously said in 2004, you can't and you probably president. know where I'm going, which, right? Which, I, this, I know, and I have paid the T price. So for tell everybody that. what you I said. I said there was at a, it, was, uh, it was at a Northwestern alumni post-election panel, the National Press Club, and people were in a rage because the, it was a Democratic audience that, the, um, that uh, John Kerry had lost, that Bush had won despite, all the, despite the Iraq War. And there was shouting, and people said, and I said there, you can't just say the president is lying. And <clears throat> because at that time, um, and people turned on me. It's still on my Wikipedia page. You'd think I was this <coughs> horrible little mouse, you know, who is afraid <laughs> of the president. <laughs> so uh, Dana remembers. And so um, uh, that, was our, that was the rule then. It was, and what I meant was, um, you can't say in the New York Times in 2004, the president lied. Um, you can say it's false, there were no weapons, there was no evidence, et cetera, et cetera. But at that time, it was uh, intent. And we didn't know intent. And so um, things have changed. <laughs> so. They certainly have. Yeah. Um, we now have a president who has described journalists as enemies of the American people and whose staff has described us as the opposition. So my question to you is, how do reporters deal with that kind of um, diatribe, and how does that affect coverage? Um, Naftali, do you want to start? Yeah, I mean, I think, 
I think there's something particular going on here. And in some ways, I think Bannon's comment about us being the opposition party is almost more telling than the president's comment about us being enemies of the American people. Because I think there's an attempt, you know, we see ourselves, and maybe this is a little bit self-aggrandizing, but we see ourselves as being nonpartisan, not having an agenda. We're not trying to get legislation passed. We're not trying to win an election. We're trying to scrutinize not just both parties, but everyone, all parties, all sources of power, and put them under the same kind of spotlight. And I think there's a group of people that want to make us combatants in the political arena, just like everybody else. There's the Democrats, the Republicans, you know, the Green Party, there's the press, just as though we're sort of part of the battle. And I think it's really important for us to resist that, uh, because I think we need to maintain our role as people who do try to scrutinize everyone, try to confirm facts as best we can. We're not trying to spin things. We're, uh, now, we make mistakes. I mean, I, I feel like sometimes in these conversations, it can come off as though, you know, we think we're perfect, and very, very far from that. But at least our goal is to try to put everybody under the same kind of scrutiny and get it all right. And, and I, I just, you know, I think there's an, so that kind of language, I think, is an attempt to shift the landscape in a way that, that, that we have to resist. Dana, do you want to defend those comments as well? Um, <laughs> no, sure. Um, well, I, I would like to say that I think the, um, the skepticism that the media is telling the truth and our skepticism that the people are covering is telling the truth goes back a long ways. And I'll mention that there was a time in the first, uh, first years of the uh, George W. Bush administration when, when Elizabeth and Jody and I were all covering the White House uh, at the same time. And I will give you an example of just how suspicious they were of us reporters. I, we were in an event, I think I it was in Philadelphia, we were going through the magnetometers and Jody apparently set it off and the <laughs> Secret Service agent said he wanted her to lift up her shirt to see what was under it. And what was under it was Alana, <laughs> who, is, who is now 16. I was eight months pregnant. She's now 16. So even then they, would, they thought this pregnant lady was trying to sneak some contraband into a, You've been uh, dining out on that story ever that's right, since. That's right. it's, a, it's a long time now. It's a long time now. And then in the Bush year, you know, what this discussion made me think of uh, um, uh, in the Bush years. In 2002, I wrote a piece that, that ran on the front page, and the headline said, for Bush, the facts are malleable. And we used every euphemism under the sun for lying. Um, but we couldn't actually say it. Um, because that, uh, that presupposed uh, motive. Um, so I, I thought I'd also introduce into the discussion the notion that I don't think we're necessarily post-truth. I think we're, the truth is just on a holiday uh, <laughs> right now, and, and, and it'll come back at some point. There was a Quinnipiac University poll last month. Uh, I no reason to think it would change. If you look overall at the country, I think it was, I may be making this up, this may be fake news, but it's, it's, <laughs> it's pretty close. Um, like 52% said they believe the news media more than Donald Trump, and 37% said they believe Donald Trump more than news media. So, that's the, so it's 37% of the country that's sort of the Alex Jones, Grassy Knoll uh, crowd here, which is larger than we ever thought. But if you look at it by party, 78% uh, of Republicans believe uh, Donald Trump uh, more than the news media. So how does that change? Because they're not, 78% of Republicans aren't crazy. Um, uh, so that's, it's sort of a partisan reflex response to defend the president. But what hap what'll happen is uh, people begin to see with their own eyes that it's not true. It's not, it won't be somebody's word against another. You know, you'll, uh, over time, you'll see that uh, he's not bringing coal jobs back to West Virginia and manufacturing back to the Midwest. And I think that's when truth returns from uh, its long sojourn that it is now on. And I just want to say they, they obviously need us as an opposition party. It's really important. He doesn't have a, 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 a opponent right now. He's got the Democrats, but he doesn't have uh, somebody. He's not running against anybody right now, and he needs that. And we're pretty good. We're a good target. And uh, it's, as you know, as we all know, in many ways, <laughs> yes, we're the enemies of the people, we're the opposition party. Uh, they all, he all, they're very accessible to us. Uh, they call us a lot. Yes. Uh, Trump called the New York Times and the Washington Post on, on Friday. His first calls to, to spin that, oh, it was all the Democrats' fault. He called our reporters. Mm -hmm. So uh, you just, we need to know the reality. They're, Steve Bannon, the whole gang in there, extremely accessible. 
Uh, so if they, if we're the, you know, if we're the fake news media, they're certainly treating us somewhat seriously. And there's another point, yeah. which is that they're they're happy to attack us when they don't like things we report, but they're just as quick to cite us when we right. report something that yeah, fits into the message too. they're trying to make. You see them quote, you know, the New York Times on a regular basis if it fits into the message they're trying to put out there. But but to sort of add a layer to what Elizabeth is saying. You know, it's true that every president, no, I don't know if a president ever liked the press. That just doesn't seem to be the way things work, and it's probably not the way things should work. Um, but, the, but he has this, but this current president has an added mechanism, which is Twitter, so that he doesn't need us to get out his message in the same way that previous presidents have. And, and I mean, I looked at his feed the other day. I think he has got like 27 million followers. I mean, we're one of the, we're one of the biggest papers in the country, we have like two million subscribers. I mean, so it gives you a sense of, of the scope. And I think there's an, a way in which, even though he does deal with us all the time, he also feels that he has this completely different, unfiltered way of getting his message out, at least to his followers. Do you worry that his demonizing of the media, even though it is true that he is talking to us, will have larger ramifications in terms of the media's credibility that can go beyond the, the length of this administration? I, you know, I, I, I sort of I agree with Dana that I think that first of all, as, as Naftali said, this this has been in terms of our readers, it's been a you know the golden era, mm -hmm. right? I mean, every time he says the failing New York Times, we get more subscribers, so that's working for us, you know. We don't, so um, and it's given I think the media a, a you know a renewed sense of mission about what we do for a mm -hmm. living, which is holding administrations accountable. Um, but I think, yeah, I worry about it. I do worry about it. I don't know. I worry about those 78% of Republicans who don't believe us. It seems like it's an awful well, large number. Well, on the positive side, it can't get much higher. <laughs> <laughs> so. And I do think that the, 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 all these, these, uh, these fake websites, that's, you know, is very, is very uh, disturbing as well. It's, it's uh, you know, you go out in the country and you see, talk to people and they just absolutely believe that you know Hillary Clinton had a you know a sex ring and that comet you know it's just it's distressing right and as we've seen that can be dangerous Dr. yeah Holly. that's the thing I mean you know we talk about fake news and so forth but one of the real issues of concern is a lot of the fake news stories seem to be targeting an individual or a group whether it's Hillary Clinton whether it's Muslims whoever it is and those things can have consequences as we saw in the comet pizza case but I, I do think the internet and the way it's framed, you know, and I hasten to say here that I think a proliferation of voices is all to the good, and I think it's great that there's all these blogs and other organizations out there. But the truth is that it used to be that you knew what you were watching if you were watching the CBS Evening News or holding a copy of one of our newspapers. Now, you know, it's easy to craft a website that looks kind of like the New York Times website. And I think just there's something about that that makes it easier to, to blur you know, the, the organizations that go to great lengths to at least try to get it right, and when we make mistakes, correct it immediately and fully, and organizations that just put information out there willy-nilly. Dana. The, the thing that I worry about is during some point when the truth uh, is still on holiday, that there is some, uh, a crisis, like God forbid, a huge terrorist attack. Uh, and then all this, so we've sort of been laying this predicate that you can't believe anything out there, and so when there is this crisis, uh, and he uh, comes out and makes up some story about who's responsible as a justification for saying, you know, rounding up all Muslims in America. That's when, that's what I'm af af afraid of occurring. It's not the, you know, the, the, the stuff we've been hearing so far about the, the, the wiretapping or the, uh, the size of the inauguration crowd or the, the people voting illegally. I mean, th I think that's all preparing for something uh, that could happen that's, that's much larger, and that's what's, that's what's scary, not what's happened so far. So do you think there's something that the media should be doing to guard against that, to prepare, oh. to make sure that we can get the truth I, out? No, I just, I mean, I don't, we're not, uh, you know, doing some sort of advocacy. We just got to keep doing our jobs, and, uh, you know, we're not out there to do a campaign, so uh, we, don't, we never defend ourselves. One of the, there, there was this great... Uh, Protest signed, you know, right after the inauguration, said, "Fact checkers of the world unite." <laughs> it's like, oh, what are we going to do? <laughs> I mean, we do. There's do, things we, small things we do different. Well, big things that uh, we do differently. Uh, you know, recently, I can't remember what Trump had said. What was it? He had said that. 
oh, right, that undocumented um, uh, workers, you know, uh, the undocumented create, uh, were responsible for more crimes than anybody else. That's false. And so I, I held up the story until we had, we, we had our, we, you know, called on our fact reader just to insert a line in the story saying, actually, studies show that native-born Americans, are, you know, uh, commit more crimes. And I just, you know, so you have to be vigilant against that kind of stuff. You just don't want, um, you know, his uh, statements to go unadulterated into, the, into, the, into print when they're absolutely false, so. One thing that he's been quite good at is when we are writing these stories and things aren't looking so good for him, he manages to change the subject, often with an early morning tweet. And we write about that. So how much do you have to pivot when he pivots, and how do you keep the focus on what it should be on? Well, we look at the, tw this is a, um, near and dear to me because we, we now have six White House reporters. It's an all-time high, as the Post has the same, because of the, um, the, the 6 a.m. tweets to the midnight tweets to the total unpredictability of, of his days. And so we need two people on during the day. And we always have a duty reporter. Now we have two duty reporters who, who um, somebody starts early and somebody goes late because somebody has to be up looking for tweets. Now we treat the tweets <laughs> like like press releases, like old-fashioned White House press releases. You look at them and say, eh, or there's news here, or we need to cover this. So we treat them like news events, and a lot of them we ignore. But, uh, and the problem is, too, when, you, when he tweets, again, it's, there's a lot of fact-checking involved. It's 6.15, you know, it's, 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 it's a struggle, but we do it. And, um, but we, we do often say there is no, you know, substance to this. For example, the, that's, that early, at 6.30 a.m. wiretapping uh, tweet on Saturday. Um, we wrote pretty quickly, unsubstantiated, no evidence. Uh, you know, we, we were pretty sure he was. Yeah, I mean, I think we're more ready for it now. Yeah. I mean, I, I think yeah. to the extent that things have changed, I feel like early on, maybe we were a little bit taken aback, mm -hmm. uh, for example, with the voter fraud thing, even though, of course, there had been some incidences during the campaign there was a way in which we maybe we were conditioned that the White House wasn't going to come out with something that was demonstrably false, you know, and then repeat it. And, and I think now we're, we're, like, we're more ready. I mean, we beefed up our White House staff as well. We have people on all the time. Part of it is an unpredictability element. You just don't know when something's going to come out or what subject it's going to be on. So you really have to be ready. And I think we are sort of more ready to challenge them instantly. Um, and you know, it's, it's, it's definitely a different way of, of going about things. I think we tend to have the resources to be able to cover what we were covering and cover the new thing. Right. But, but this has been an issue from time immemorial. The president always, to some degree, had the ability to change the subject, and they all used it. The difference is now he can do it more quickly. He can do it at 6 o'clock in the morning with a quick tweet, and all of a sudden it's something we sometimes really do have to cover. You talked about, uh, oh, I'm being signaled. Please pass your questions to the far sides. They will be collected and uh, given to Rabbi Zemel to uh, sift through to make sure they're sharp. Thank you. Uh, Elizabeth, you mentioned that the, um, the White House still does talk to the New York Times and all of the publications here, um, that the president did call you on Friday. His staff also talks to everybody. It's, every president rails about leaks, and every White House leaks. This one seems to leak an awful lot. <laughs> um, even as the president talks about these anonymous sources who don't actually exist, we know they do exist. Yeah, they're down the hall from him, right? Right. So, but some people in the White House, in addition to the president, have talked in, in falsehoods. Right. Um, so how do you deal with those people? Do you continue to talk to those people? Do you treat them any differently? Well, we, we're, we're, much, we're really careful. It's really hard. You, get, uh, you, know, you can ask the same question of two very senior staff members. This happens with our White House correspondents. And you get completely opposite answers. And who is lying? You know, who's got a knife out for who? It's very hard to, to discern. Uh, uh, it's, it's much harder to report. There's a lot of factions inside the White House right now, more than we're used to. There's, um, it's much more, there's much more warfare between the staff. And so you just have to, um, we do a lot of reporting. And sometimes it's just, 
on one hand someone's saying this, the other person's saying that. You know, it's, it's just really hard to know <coughs> what's going on in there. I can think of one thing more, it happens just this over this weekend, there was something we were chasing and um, we checked it out. I can't get into it, but it, let me tell you something. It was, <laughs> you, you, check it, you check it with the FBI, you check it around with other parts of the administration. You definitely have to be super careful. Does there ever come a point for any of you where you just are going to stop talking to a certain person because they tell too many untruths? Well, I, I don't, you know, maybe I'm giving away a little too much here, but I don't have a lot of really great sources <laughs> yeah, but in the Trump White House. <laughs> Um, well, I thought out. they loved you. Don't they? <laughs> um, I was. I was kind of friendly with Sean Spicer before he became a madman. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know what happened. He seemed, he seemed perfectly normal. Um, so, uh, so I don't. I'm not. I don't have to deal with that. You know, problem of being lied to. Um, <laughs> since I'm not being spoken to. Um, but, Dana but Milbank, the White House doesn't but, lie to me. Sir, right, no, 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 never, never lie to me. Um, but certainly the notion of people lying on background is something that's always occurred. Uh, and that's the best place to do it because there's no you know, penalty for it and, it and it and it can't be traced. So that that part, that sort of thing, I think, is is not necessarily new. Now what's new is you know, the, the Bowling Green Massacre and other things that his advisors are saying on the record, which shows that they've essentially learned from, from the boss. But we, we would never, to answer your question, we would never not talk to somebody. I think it's a little bit different on television where mm -hmm. it's giving somebody, to some degree, an unfiltered opportunity mm -hmm. to, to say what they want to say. I mean, I can interview somebody for an hour. I don't have to use anything they say if I think that it's not true, or I could say that they said something untrue, but here's what the reality is. So I can't see a situation in which we would just decide we're not even going to talk to somebody who's in a position of power and authority because they have a record of untruths. We would exercise perhaps a little more caution. But again, I, th I think that might apply a little more to television, where maybe in some cases there's a reluctance to just give somebody a platform. I'd like to talk for a minute about Trump supporters. The media were roundly criticized and criticized themselves after the election for failing to capture the mood of the country, failing to understand why people were supporting Donald Trump. And um, a lot of those people continue to support Donald Trump. And I'm wondering, um, we all work for organizations that often are called the elite media, um, how you try to change that, how you try to make sure you're adequately and accurately reflecting what's really going on in the country. Well, we now we now <laughs> I you know the, um, we now go out more much more often to parts of the country where there's a lot of Trump supporters and talk to them. Those stories tend to have, until recently, they've tended to have the same they're the same story over and over again. That when, no matter what he does, we love him. You know, there's a certain one note aspect to these stories, um, and I think more recently we're seeing that people are saying, well. You know, I really like my health care. Let me see what he really does. Or, you know, I don't know. You know, so you're getting a little bit of that. So we are just paying more attention. But, um, uh, you know, the, I don't know that the answer is going out to Louisiana every, every two weeks and talking to people who love Donald Trump and aren't following the news that much. I mean, also, I mean, there's always a danger in these situations that you sound defensive. But, I mean, we all sent people out to Trump country constantly during the campaign. And we, they were all, I mean, in fact, the stories were even parodied at some point because yeah. you'd go to some little town know, know. where Main Street was boarded up and the factory had closed and you'd quote some person about how angry they were and how they were going to vote for Trump. And, um, you know, clumsy as it may have been, there were, I think, plenty of attempts we all made. Now, we got the election wrong, and I certainly wouldn't want to sugarcoat that, and uh, so did everybody else. I mean, I would argue that the Trump campaign didn't think they were going to win, um, and that is something that really requires well, actually, some... can I just interject? We, the, the, the polls were right. right. Hillary Clinton won by two percentage points with the popular vote, just to, just to get that on the record. Yeah, yeah, that's, I, I that's agree. true. It, it was we the state-by-state state polls. Yeah, we should have been sophisticated enough to know that even right. if she... Anyway, the point is, I think that does require some self-scrutiny, and I think we really do need to wrestle with why, you know, why we did get that wrong. Um, but I mean, if there's a broader question about... Um, you know, whether people who work at our sorts of organizations live in big cities and live on the East Coast, and there's this whole huge population out there that doesn't share some of our values. I mean, I think those are worthwhile questions to ask. I don't think they justify anybody ignoring facts that we put out there 
because we're not culturally like them. So I think, I mean, there's a lot sort of going on there in terms of, in terms of that question. And one question may be whether they are actually paying attention to our news organizations or focusing on ones that they agree with. Um, which is true on, I think, both sides of the equation. Um, Dana, I see you furrowing your brow over yeah. there, so I, I want to be I, sure well, that you I'll have a chance now, to. now, but they, uh, I, yeah, I don't, I don't, I'm not saying my fellow panelists are, but I don't buy into the self-flagellation that's been going on in the media about, Good. you know, just being completely blindsided by this phenomenon that nobody had any idea of. You know, as Elizabeth pointed out, uh, what were the final polls were three or four points for mm -hmm. Clinton, and she won by two. So, um, uh, and obviously everybody was aware of this phenomenon out there. So if you're aware of a phenomenon that's 44% and turns out to be 41%, that doesn't mean you weren't aware of the phenomenon. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a lot of self-criticism for saying, you know, we're not taking Trump supporters uh, seriously, uh, you know, mocking them. I, uh, now, I, I, do, I do mockery, but, you know, certainly I, I don't think you'll find anything I was writing, or for that matter, what anybody else was writing was mocking the very real economic concerns that were going on, on that are going on around the country and have been going on for some time and have gotten worse. Uh, and we did a great deal about that. Now, um, when that, uh, when the, the support for Trump was expressed in terms of you know, outright uh, uh, racism and bigotry, well, yeah, then I would, uh, uh, I and I think others would say, no, that was that was unacceptable, and that's uh, and that's not okay. That's not uh, that's not uh, uh, you know not accepting the legitimate uh, beliefs of millions of Americans. That's saying no, we're, this bigotry isn't okay, no matter who is doing it and how many of you are doing it. Do you think we missed another story, or perhaps underplayed another story, which had to do with Russia? During the campaign, I mean, the 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 Clinton the Clinton campaign um, did try to get all of us to spend more time focusing on the role of Russia and hacking John Podesta's emails and the DNC's emails. It, it was written about, but it was never really elevated uh, to a particularly high level. Um, what what do you all think, Elizabeth? What I do you think? think well, about we that? were we were um, involved in both stories. Um, the Russia story uh, became clear much later in the campaign. That's the that's the that's the truth. In September, uh, there was this. We've written about it, so I can talk about it. There was there was the FBI was alarmed over this back channel between supposed back channel between the Alpha Bank in Moscow and the Trump Organization in New York. Uh, we spent weeks on that, weeks and weeks and weeks, and looking at it. Um, and the FBI cooled to it after a while, and ultimately. If you don't know what it is, which we didn't, and now they, they, they now we're not sure what it was, and it doesn't seem to be what we thought it was, or the FBI thought. So yeah, we we um, and the, I know the Democrats are going to be furious about this forever, but um, <clears throat> we just didn't have the facts to go with the big story on that at the time. And um, and again, the the Clinton email investigation began much the summer before 2015. <clears throat> Uh, it was a criminal investigation, um, and uh, it played out over a much longer period of time, and the Russian investigation got going much later, and we were, didn't know about it until much later. So yes, I can see the, um, the anger among the Democrats, um, but we were not, um, we, uh, I, I can assure you that we focused on it in, in Washington and wrote the, as much as we could, and we're still continuing, obviously, to write about it now. At uh, his press conferences, particularly those with foreign leaders, the president has called primarily on reporters from conservative news organizations. And sometimes we've had to rely on the foreign press to ask the toughest questions of our own president. So is there a way that you can deal with that? Is there anything to do? Well, I, mean, I guess the first question is whether there's anything wrong with it. And is there? I think, um, you know, I, I did used to work for, I covered the White House for the Chicago Tribune, and it, you know, it pissed me off that sometimes the favorable treatment that the Journal and the Times and the Post got. So I am not somebody who's going to say that organizations that don't have a certain profile shouldn't be called on and shouldn't get to ask questions. The thing that I do think is of concern is if those are softball questions. And I think that no matter who the president is, what the administration is, 
you know, they're going to have a lot of events where everyone tells them how great they are. Some of the few events where people are going to ask them difficult questions is press conferences and press availabilities. And so I do get concerned when I see questions coming from whoever it is, the foreign media. You know, there's another thing they do during Sean Spicer's briefings where they now bring in via video uh, yeah. local reporters. And again, mm -hmm. that's great as long as those don't tend to be extremely positive softball questions. So my concern would be less who's being called on than just the fact that the tough, difficult questions are being asked. Uh, and they certainly are not always being asked in, in the six, uh, circumstances that you're, you're talking about. Um, I think the, uh, the, the I, I've been amused by the, you know, piping in the, the uh, you know, the questioners from local outlets. Like, they, I was listening to the briefing one day, and I think it was like Montana Day or something. And it's like, you know, the first question is like, are you going to build a wall with Canada? And then the second question, are you going to build a wall with Canada? So, and then even Spicer <laughs> started to laugh at what he had produced here. Um, but, uh, so I know I'm not concerned. You know, I kind of enjoy it when, uh, the president or the press secretary passes over all the TV networks and you know goes to somebody in the back row. I'm, that's because they're all not going to get their airtime. That's fine. Uh, that's fine. What's not fine uh, was when uh, uh, Spicer invited select groups for a gaggle, uh, uh, select organizations uh, uh, in his office, and that was protested, I think, you know, properly so. Uh, what's not fine is uh, the Secretary of State uh, taking uh, one reporter mm -hmm. from a, a favorable outlet uh, on his plane to showing the world, showing the Chinese that this is the proper way to deal with media in a free society. So, uh, so that's not okay. So, uh, but in terms of you know questions getting asked, uh, the questions get asked. Regarding the gaggle that um, some of our news organizations were excluded from, and um, some of the other treatment. A lot of people have asked me, why don't you all just not go? Why doesn't everybody just not go to a background briefing? Why does, didn't everybody walk out of that gaggle? Elizabeth, can you explain uh, well, the problem there? What was very confused. Uh, people didn't know. I, I mean, the people who were, we were, we were excluded along with you, and who else was it? The post didn't Buzz show up. Buzz yeah. Yeah. It, wasn't, it wasn't deliberate. Yes. <laughs> I think they were we, at lunch. We noticed that the New York Times. <laughs> I think Politico uh, and BuzzFeed that's were right, yes. excluded. That's so, right, um, yes. I think the, the problem was uh, that it was, a, it, was a, it was supposed to be an open briefing for everybody, and then all of a sudden they shut it down and invited just who they wanted, and so that was the problem. Um, and the other, the people who went in who didn't protest later said, I think the journal said, that they didn't realize what was happening. So, that and, that, and that we wouldn't go. I mean, I think, I think yeah. we put out a statement saying we're not going to do this if this comes up in the future. But it was, as Elizabeth says, sort of this confused situation. People didn't know exactly what was happening in that moment. And I think, I don't think they've done it again. Since no, I don't th they got such, they got such grief for it. I do not think they will do it again. I mean, unless they're, unless they, uh, uh, unless the circumstance, they get really angry about something, but it, you, you've noticed they haven't done it. So, Naftali, you work for an organization that is, you knew this was coming, I did that, was, that, was owned, that is owned by um, somebody who is friendly with the president. And I'm wondering, does that put you under any kind of different constraints? Does it make your jobs any more difficult or less difficult? Well, I mean, I don't think it puts us under particular constraints. I mean, the thing I always feel like I need to say, most people know this, not everyone does, is that we are completely separate from the editorial page. There's the news operation and the mm -hmm. editorial page. It is what it is. They do what they do. I don't talk to them. I rarely even read what they write. <laughs> um, and we just try to do our job as best we can. And I, I just, I mean, I think we've been pretty tough on Trump. I think if, uh, if you were to read our coverage of this administration, we've broken stories, we've written you know, tough pieces about the disarray in the White House, and you know, we just, I think, have held him to account as, you know, as, much, as much as we could. Mm -hmm. In addition to attacking news outlets, a lot of news outlets, um, the president, um, and, and as, particularly as a candidate, sometimes singled out individual reporters. Um, and there's been a lot of, there have been a lot of very nasty, tweets, uh, racial, anti-Semitic, not by him, but by um, readers, viewers, uh, attacking these reporters. It seemed to have created this um, echo chamber of 
hatred. And I'm wondering if um, any of you are concerned either for your own safety or for those of other of your reporters. And have you had to take steps to protect them? Uh, uh, not so far. There have been a few things, but not so far. And it's, it's stopped mm -hmm. since the campaign. Largely, we had a, um, an incident. There's been a couple with some of the um, uh, J Jewish reporters in the bureau, and but um, you know it goes, it starts on Twitter, and it gets very, very ugly, mm -hmm. it gets really scary, but but then it abates. So right now we've done, we know we uh, we keep an eye on it. But the sad truth is, is this this is not a Trump phenomenon in the sense that there's been this concern about safety of the press for some time now, and we all were very aware of the Charlie Hebdo uh, incident in Paris, and we've certainly beefed up security over the years. I don't think we've beefed it up particularly because of what's happened in the last few months, but over time, it's something we've had to think about. So I think we're going to move on to some of your excellent questions, which probably are better than my questions, so. These are all. OK, all right. I'm sure we'll have more coming my way. All right. This one says, please characterize the sources who are providing quote unquote truths to the press from inside the Trump administration and the Republican Congress. Right. We'll list all our sources. <laughs> and what are their agendas? So. Um, who wants to take that? Well, I, I'm not going to announce all of our sources here at <laughs> oh, the. Come on. Maybe, I, maybe, I, maybe. I brought a pen I will to write the them down. Would you do that, please? Yeah. That'd be great. Maybe it, it, is there a way to characterize? Uh, well, they're they're very senior aides to the president and uh, uh, senior aides to people on the Hill. Uh, we don't use anymore. We do not use background. We don't use uh, you know. He's a horrible person," said a senior White House advisor. We don't do that anymore. We are not allowed to. We don't use background information in quotes. We can characterize it, and we almost always um, characterize the agenda of the source. Um, and you you know there is our readers dis hate um, background you know anonymous sources in the New York Times where we. Uh, we, uh, our public editor goes after us all the time about it. That said, it would be very hard to report anything in Washington without talking to people on background. Um, and, but, you, but if you talk to you know, 20 people for a story, you're, you're in a pretty good shape of characterizing the lay of the land and the state of play in a certain issue and a certain controversy at the White House. So. I mean, also, we quote, we quote sources who know what they're talking about. Yeah, I mean, yeah, thank I mean, you for saying that. <laughs> I mean, because I think there's this idea sometimes. Speak for we, yourself. <laughs> uh, so other than Dana, you know, I mean, in other words, I think there's this idea sometimes that we talk to somebody who might have heard something from somebody else, and they, that's a source. And then mm. another guy who heard from the same right. guy, and that's another source. I mean, we try to be really, a source is a, somebody with first-hand knowledge of something that happened. And we use this phrasing now, people familiar with the matter, which sounds a little awkward, but it's a, I think it's our way of saying, not just a guy who heard something. And so, you know, we have multiple sources for sensitive stories. And um, yeah, I mean, they tend to be pretty, in this White House, they do, many of them are fairly high, highly placed. And we try to be pretty careful about it. So a couple of people asked how we actually get sources to talk to us. Oh, um, that's fun. Yeah. So well, it's, it, the sources aren't doing it out of the goodness of their hearts. They have <laughs> agendas. They have a storyline they want to drive. There's, this is a transactional relationship. Do not, it's, this is not about friendship. Uh, and it is, um, it is uh, you know, you can develop sources. You have, a source has to be comfortable with the reporter. So some of the best reporters in the Washington Bureau, uh, they've been there for a long time. They have sources deep within the national security apparatus, this sort of permanent government that's been there for a long time. They have sources on the Hill. They've got sources all over town. And that's the, that's the result of, first of all, people want to talk to the, many people want to talk to the New York Times. Let's be honest. They want to drive a message into the Times or try to. Uh, number two, they, you, they develop trust with certain reporters who it's lunches, it's dinners, it's drinks, it's just developing a trust that you can talk to this reporter, he or she is not going to uh, blow your cover, he's not, you know, whatever. Um, it's, it's a long, Eric Schmidt, uh, fabulous, uh, counter, covers counterterrorism for us, has been in, has sources um, embedded 
throughout the Pentagon, the, uh, the National Security Council, uh, uh, overseas, uh, in, in overseas, he's got lots of sources. I mean, he's an astonishing reporter. So that's, that's kind of, and then Carl Hulse has been covering the Hill forever. He's our chief Washington correspondent, has sources all over the Hill. I mean, it's just, um, you know, I'm, good reporters have what used to be called a very fat Rolodex. <laughs> Uh, I, and sin I, since I don't have any sources, I feel <laughs> that I'm on safe ground sort of explaining how it all works. Um, and, and, but what's going on here is there's a lot of access to grind here. So you've got people, factions in the White House trying to get uh, uh, their word out. Uh, folks on the Hill are not, at, uh, you know, Republicans on the Hill are not all, at all in line with what the White House is doing. So they uh, um, want to get uh, their word in there. Uh, the, the, the president has basically declared war on the intelligence community, so they have a very real incentive to be uh, speaking up. And then, you know, for every faction in the White House, each of those persons talks to all their friends who then talk to uh, reporters at our organization. So there's, there's always this huge web, but now people have a lot of um, uh, uh, anger and you know, scores to settle, so it makes it much easier. Well, a couple of quick things. So first of all, what that does is it makes it incumbent upon us to understand the agenda of the person who's talking to us and to, you know, that, now, that doesn't mean that, it, I mean, information's information. If it's true, it's true, uh, for whatever reason they gave it to us. But at, sometimes it helps to know. But also, I've been amazed at how many people talk to us just because they kind of want to, somebody's interested in what they know, and, and yeah. It, yeah, it, it's extraordinary to me. That's a great point. I remember I, um, Charlie Black, you remember, um, he yes. was a great, um, he was, he was a consultant on the McCain campaign, and, you know, it was a long campaign. And I remember, uh, you know, uh, it was late in the campaign. McCain wasn't doing well, very well. We were having drinks, you know, after the campaign day. And, um, I, he, you know, I, he said, I finally said, to him, why do you all talk to us? He said, you know why we talk to you? He said, because you're interested in what we do. At the end of the day, you are hanging on to every word that I'm telling you, you know? <laughs> and it was like this insight after all those years in journalism, I thought, oh, right. You know, we, 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 we're deeply interested. And then they open the paper the next day, <laughs> yes. and it's like, ooh, I'm a person familiar with that. <laughs> I mean, there's, there's something about that, about that somebody's really interested in what you're saying, and then yeah. it's going to give that widespread exposure. So there right. are all the agendas we need to be aware of, but there's also this basic human thing that I am continually surprised by and how people want to talk just because you want to listen. Yeah. Right. And I, I'm glad you brought up that it's transactional, though, because I think that that really is important. Along those lines, somebody had asked uh, about Steve Bannon and his influence within this White House. Who wants to, who wants to talk about Steve? <laughs> or, or do I have to? <laughs> I mean, what's, what's the question exactly? What's the question? Yes. Describe yeah. the question. The question is, uh, what is your estimation on Bannon's influence? Um, and... Uh, Talk about it in terms of uh, <laughs> the best truthiness. <laughs> I'm just the reader. <laughs> He's got enormous influence right now, enormous influence on the president. Uh, and um, we'll see how long he stays in that job. But right now, it doesn't look like he's going anywhere. Uh, I, I, you know, Maggie Haber can, Haberman can talk more about this than I can because she deals deals with everybody over there more directly, also the other White House correspondents. But uh, he, um, he and Trump, you know, they're both sort of outsiders, you know, anti-elites in, in a strange way. Trump, you know, coming from Queens, trying to make it in Manhattan. Steve Bannon the same way, feeling um, put down by the elites. Uh, there's a tie there right now, and Bannon's quite smart. Um, uh, in some ways, so I, that he's, you want to go, go on? I mean, he seems to reassure Trump in certain ways about what he's doing and the cause that he is ostensibly advancing. I mean, as others have alluded to, there is a tremendous amount of factionalism, I think, in this White House. There isn't perhaps every right. White House, but more than in most. And he's the leader, or at least a big player in one faction. Um, the factions don't always align the way you might think. Um, but he clearly represents this sort of, you know, I'm coming to Washington to break things up and change the way things are done, and I represent the people, and, and, and that's sort of part of the Trump coalition. 
Do you think there's well, anybody what, in the don't White Don't you want to hear from my sources? Oh, no, no. yes. What do your sources say about <laughs> My sources tell me, by which I mean my colleagues write in the Washington Post, um, <laughs> that uh, uh, well, we had originally been thinking that, OK, Ryan's previous the establishment would be this counterweight uh, to Steve Bannon. But now they've formed essentially an alliance. So there is not that counterweight. And uh, to the extent that there's any counterweight, uh, to uh, Steve Bannon, it's sort of the Jared Kushner, uh, Gary Cohn, you know, Wall Street types, but they don't seem to have anywhere near the uh, influence. So it's it's Steve Bannon's world, and we're all just living in it. Another question that uh, several people ask is about the health care issue, and uh, whether you where you think it will go from here and how what happened this week will um, impact the rest of Trump's agenda. I, I mean, I can take that. That's, we're, we're, that's the question we're asking ourselves right now. What does Trump do now? You saw that Paul Ryan said Obamacare is here to stay for the foreseeable future. It's quite, quite extraordinary. So the question is, does Trump and the White House and, and, H, and the HHS, do they, do they sabotage the existing law? And then, in, in some way, and then there's ways they can do it. And then, do they then turn around in a year when it falls apart and blame the Democrats? I think that's a that's a pretty risky strategy because after you've been president for more than a year, to suddenly say it's all Obama's fault, they or they could just leave it alone. It's it's a good question. I mean, right now there's a there's a um, a lawsuit, uh, the House versus the administration. The Admo the Obama administration was fighting it. Uh, House members said that the um, the subsidies for the health care uh, for health care were, were unauthorized. And so if that lawsuit goes forward and the House wins, that completely, uh, that, that really hurt, destroy, hurts the law because all of a sudden you'd lose all the subsidies. The question is, here's a big question, will the Trump administration uh, fight that lawsuit or, or, or let it go and just let health care collapse? Um, it's, it's a very... Uh, it's the big question of the day. What do you think? Well, but I also think it raises questions about the rest of the agenda. And, 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 yeah. and you know, this was, I mean, let's not forget, the president said, we're voting. And, you know, it's now or never, do or die. And Ryan and his team said, we have the vote. This will happen. We have the votes. And those things proved to be pretty dramatically wrong. And I think that weakens their credibility among their own people. I think the Freedom Caucus has shown that they can stand up kind of with impunity and change the agenda as they see fit. And so I think this also undermines a lot of what they're going to uh, try to do going forward. They talk a lot about how, well, OK, this didn't work out. On to tax reform. I mean, good luck. I, I just think I just think this was supposed I mean, the to. Whole, the whole reason for doing health care first was so you could you could um, get revenue, you know, lower get, lower the cost of health care, get some revenue, and then you do the tax cuts. That makes now it's even harder. And right, in some ways, it was supposed to be the easy one because it's something the whole right. party agreed on. They've been talking about forever. They'll just get this done, and they'll move, then they'll move on to their real, more complicated agenda of tax reform. And so they're left in a situation where it's not, I mean, what I found striking about it is I thought maybe they'd have trouble getting it through the Senate. I certainly thought they'd have trouble coming together between the House and the Senate. The one thing I really didn't think is that with a big majority and no procedural stalling tactics that the other side can use, that they'd have trouble getting it through the House. And the fact that they couldn't even come together to do that on something they've been talking about for all these years, I think really weakens them going, going forward. Uh, I agree that the... Um, <laughs> that the momentum uh, is significant here. And when, once you have a, a, a big policy failure, it's very hard to pick up and do other things. We saw this in the, the second Bush term after the, the failure of the Social Security uh, reform. We really couldn't get anything going after that. I want to add something to what Elizabeth was saying. That's, I think they already are sabotaging. I mean, that's been the policy all along, just suspending the advertising uh, for the enrollment putting out an executive order, may, basically making it sound like nobody's going to be punished if they don't uh, fulfill the individual mandate, uh, getting rid of the uh, risk corridors, like other things just to make it collapse. Well, so, and that, where, where do you think that goes for them when it collapses? Well, that's the, it, it will collapse at the rate it's going because of what's been going on here. Then the question is, will people, and that's, that's a huge gamble, right? Will people actually uh, blame Obamacare and the Democrats, or will they say, no, it was on your watch that this thing's collapsed? So that's one heck of a gamble. So, so one uh, smart questioner just pointed out that, that uh, perhaps this week's news shows that facts actually do play a role 
in what's going on in Washington. And um, do, do you agree with that? Did, did facts win the day this, this past week? I thought week? the Freedom Caucus won. Yeah, I mean, I, exactly. Well, but I is that draw, factual? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't draw that conclusion necessarily from the events of the day. I mean, I think you could argue the opposite, that, that the Freedom Caucus has this idea that somehow they'll prevail in the end, and despite what seemed the obvious way to go to repeal and replace Obamacare, that was not what, what they were interested in. So I'm not sure that I'd make that, I'd draw that conclusion. Uh, so a couple of questioners asked you to uh, prognosticate, which I know you're in the business of doing, what's going to happen with the Russia story. Does anyone want to take a stab at, at that? Maybe Dana can blow since, out on since I Since I've got nothing to lose. But, what do your sources <laughs> tell you? Um, Did, has Putin called you recently? <laughs> we went horseback riding. That don't go any further. <laughs> to my sukkah on, on horseback. Um, look, uh, nobody knows. Nobody knows what what the, the facts are, where or where it ends. What we did learn in the last week is that um, clearly Devin Nunes and the House Intelligence Committee aren't terribly interested in finding out about it. So, uh, and and probably. Uh, not much better in the Senate. So the real question is, you know, it's all on the FBI, which uh, uh, is led by a man who none of us can necessarily predict. Um, uh, I can't imagine there's going to be a special prosecutor. So uh, it's a, you know, it's, it's a real question of what comes out in, in the long run. Elizabeth, how about you add something to that? Uh, I don't want to answer this question. I think that um, <laughs> that's why I called on you. Um, <laughs> Uh, we've got a big, and we've got an investigative team in the bureau now. Looking, we've been looking into this for a long time. Uh, I don't know where it's going to go. It could, it could possibly take years, because it's a counterintelligence investigation. It's not, and sometimes we, you never know what happens in those. Um, so I can't predict. Um, there is a lot there for reporters to look at, though. I can say that. So here's a, an excellent question. If the Trump presidency ends in a constitutional crisis, <laughs> and in parentheses it says his resignation or impeachment, is it important for national depolarization that hardcore Trump supporters see that Trump is not a victim of the media? And if so, how should the media make sure, or how can it ensure <clears throat> that he's not seen as a media victim. Why don't you answer that? Um, well, well, first of all, the polarization that D Donald Trump didn't uh, invent, he's just exploiting it. So this, this has been going on for you know, a generation or so. So I, I don't think whatever happens to Trump, anything uh, changes with that. I mean, if you look at sort of you know, the so sociology of it all, yes, there would need to be some sort of ritual humiliation, but that doesn't occur, you know. Uh, uh, Trump would just go away with his supporters, uh, all of them feeling aggrieved and angry at the system. So uh, uh, I, don't, I don't see that as a solution. I don't see any necessary, necessarily see any solution on the horizon. I mean, it depends on what the impeachment is about and what the resignation is about. I think, you, you know, we need to know <clears throat> what, what drove it before we are assume, assuming his Trump, his supporters will continue to rally around him. But I mean, leaving this hypothetical impeachment and resignation <laughs> aside, I mean, you know, there's, there is probably a segment of the population that does blame us mm -hmm. when things happen uh, to Trump. And I, and I don't know what the solution is to that other than just to try to tell the story as best we can. And, you know, when the Democrats do things that questions needs to be raised about to do that as well. But I mean, I think, again, leaving aside any issue of a constitutional crisis, there's a percentage of the population that's going to blame us. So, so how do we get back to the pre-post-truth era? How do we get back to making sure that people know we are about the truth and getting a greater credibility back? Um, can, we get, can we get out of this post-truth uh, moniker? 
I mean, it's a hard thing to do. These, there's some pretty big social forces at work here that I think asking us how we can change, you know, it's, it's a tall order. I mean, beyond just trying to do the best we can, I, I have noticed this thing that where I think all of our organizations are trying to explain a little more what we do and how we do it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have this series of videos, you know, that's how a story was, was obtained. Um, and we've done that for a couple of our big, more impact uh, more impactful, if that's a word, uh, stories. It and is I, now. Yeah, it's like post-truth. And, um, and, and I, I've seen that in other organizations as well, just trying to explain, a, because I do think that there's a certain, uh, I mean, not surprisingly, people don't know exactly how we go about doing what we do, and the whole architecture that we do put in place to avoid errors, and when errors are made, acknowledge them and correct them and try to avoid them going forward. And, and just, you know, people have sometimes, I think, this almost demonic impression of, 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 the, of the press and, and what we do, particularly in a lot of parts of the country. So there's been a little bit of that trying to explain it, but I think ultimately, you know, we just have to do our jobs as best we can. I, I agree, we're, we're doing things on them. You know, we're, we're, we have a, something called Times Insider, which exp again explains how we get stories, how, how certain reporters, you know, went to war zones, what they did. There's a, there's a, a it's in the works now to change the way we, um, the bylines and, and the datelines, it turns out that younger readers have, many younger readers have no idea what datelines mean. That they, you say Baghdad, and you know, it turns out, oh, you're really in Baghdad? Yeah, well, yes. You know, but, um, <laughs> but um, so we're trying to change saying, you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, Tim Arango in Baghdad, or Tim, you know, just changing into just more, uh, uh, more sense of, of our reporters are there on the ground, we're all over the world, we're all over the country, uh, and, just, and just drive that home more. Right now, it, it's, we do more first person now, uh, and so I don't, it, it's, um, you know, more video, people, t more, more, you know, uh, we do a lot now with, um, <coughs> these things called uh, live chats where the little pictures of the reporter comes up as Trump is speaking. We have like a panel of our White House correspondents, you know, commenting on it without p opinion, but saying, well, that's interesting he said that. So, and, you know, that, again, there's much more of, a, of an attempted conversation with readers. So, Dana, I'm gonna ask you the last question here. How do we get the Oxford English Dictionary next year to make post-truth post the word of the year? <laughs> there, uh, um, actually, the was it is it Merriam-Webster that's been uh, trolling Trump on Twitter? I think they have with their with their definitions. No, like it's them, Saturday Night Live, and Teen Vogue have been <laughs> the three major forces fighting to save our, uh, our democracy. Um, so uh, that's 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 what's on this side. Um, so uh, I don't know. I, I I like what these guys are saying about you know efforts to demystify what we're doing. I don't really think it's, that, which is good, that should be done, but I'm not sure that we can do anything about changing all of this. So what either, what, you know, people often compare this to, you know, the um, 1850s. Um, and so, well, there's, there's one way to reset this, and that's what, that, that didn't work out so well, right? <laughs> um, uh, but, you know, a major crisis could do that, you know, mm -hmm. bigger than 9-11, bigger than the, the 2008 financial collapse. It'll just reset everything. Uh, or it'll just be a change in generational leadership and something quietly, you know. It has to get better, but it's not, it's not like there's something we can do. We can do things at the margins and then just keep doing our jobs. Great. Well, thank you so much. Thank you all so much, and I just want to repeat what Dana just said. Um, keep doing your jobs, and thank you from all of us for doing what you do. Thank you. Thank you.